I remember pulling my shelter out and thinking, I can't believe I'm doing this. The hardest part when the decision came was the fact that uh, we were gonna have to deploy. And I went, I, it was denial. I said, no way. I pulled mine out and I looked at it and looked at the red tab and had been through the training every year like we do and kind of said to myself, man, I can't really believe I'm doing this. My way of thinking every year we we do shelter training was all, oh, it's just, you know, going through the, the, the motions. I'm never going to have to get in this. I'm never going to be in that position. You watch these videos every year and everyone, everyone watches them from like a, a backed up perspective. Like, I don't, that won't happen to me. You know, I, I'm, you know, I have people around me and from my experience, you know, we can, we'll stay out of situations like that. At that deployment site, threw down the cross cut, took off my PG bag, and literally I said to myself, I can't believe this is happening. Never ever thought I'd be doing this, grabbing my shelter out of my pack. These firefighters thought they would never have to deploy their fire shelters. They watched videos like these and took their annual safety refresher, believing it would never happen to them. Now, they are openly sharing their stories with you in hopes their experiences can help you if you ever find yourself in a similar situation. You just realize that if you went through really, really intense, intense heat and something that hardly, I mean, you don't want to go through, but that you made it through, you just want to be able to pass on what you've been able to take out of it and how you felt and what worked well, what didn't work well, and try to pass that on to people because you don't wish this upon anybody, but if there's ever a situation where you do get put in it, you want people to be able to have that slide to pull up to say, hey, this is what they did, or this is what I remember in training, or this is what I remember hearing, and that'll make that situation hopefully better for them. The goals of this program are to help you understand what you may experience in a fire shelter deployment and survive it. It will help you put yourself in the boots of those firefighters who have deployed their fire shelters. This program is divided into two sections, fire shelter deployment stories, and common insights. In the story section, fire shelter deployment stories are presented. Firefighters will share in detail their experiences from the moment they realized they were entrapped to what they saw and felt while inside their shelters. These stories focus on the actual shelter deployments and not on what mistakes led to deployment. In the second section, the firefighters share their insights from their shelter deployments Despite different fire situations, these firefighters will describe how they experienced similar conditions and issues when deploying their shelters. These common insights have been grouped into seven sections. This program is not designed to be viewed in one sitting or in any particular order. For first-time viewings, pick a story or two to view and discuss, and then review some of the common insights. Save the rest of the stories and common insights for another training or safety meeting. We are not advocating or glorifying the use of fire shelters in this program. Remember, do everything you can to avoid situations where you might need to use a fire shelter. So there is no guarantee using a fire shelter will save your life, but the lessons in this program may give you a better chance of survival. When listening to these firefighter stories, put yourself in their place. Don't focus on what led to the situation, but how they dealt with it once there. It occurred August 23rd of 2006 in Elko, Nevada. Um, it was the mud fire. When we initial attacked it, it was around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We uh, tied in with the division at the Snowball Ski Resort. The way we were running, um, we were attached kind of to the local um, Carlin uh, engine. We also had a uh, Type 4 engine from uh, Carson City BLM. We had a, the Type 4 from uh, the Elko BLM, and then we also had another Type 6 from the Kingman, Arizona BLM. Um, so we are kind of a little task force put together, and the division wanted us to go out and see what we could do about possibly firing out, either flanking or direct. Captains got together, the engine bosses got together, and made the decision that we were going to go, that they were going to go up in the, the chase truck and scout it out. 
leaving the engine operators to, to be with the engines and the crews. As we were talking, the uh, task force leader got on the, on the radio and said, you know, we have this window to burn. We need to get up the road and, and um, head up and, and implement this, this burnout operation. I had talked, to, talked it over with the other engine operators and said, hey, well, I, you know, I've been up this road. There's a couple of roads at Spiderweb. I'll lead it out, being a Type 6 engine, a little smaller. And then me and Chris jumped in, and us being us, we had to be at the front of the pack, and we were going in there. And as soon as we were getting in, we could see the fire. Well, we, had a, we were going, it was, it, the roads weren't bad. They were just windy and stuff and dirt roads. So as soon as we got in, we went through like a little narrow canyon. Then we found ourselves, we were on a mid-slope, one-track road going through. We got to a point where we came out of a drainage, kind of went mid-slope and up to the ridge top. At that point, um, the, one of the engine operators from the uh, Elko engine said, hey, uh, Chris, do you see off to your left-hand side, do you see the fire? We could see uh, off the left-hand side a, a saddle that the fire was starting to boil over. Um, I said, yeah, I, I, I have eyes on it, and I had just passed a turnaround area. The engines turned around there. I went up the road to turn around, and by the time I had turned around, the fire had jumped the road behind me, cutting off my escape route to my safety zone. I had asked the Elko engine, can I get through that? And he said, no, uh, I, I don't think you'd be able to make it. At that point, I decided I'm going to go up. My escape route was going to be back up the road to where the captains were, and that was gonna, and head to their safety zone. Uh, at that point, we, could, we proceeded up the road, and I got a call. I finally got a hold of my captain. My captain said, "Chris, do not come up the road. We, we're getting hit hard by fire at this point. I've already committed up the road. I've got fire that has jumped the road behind me, and I'm, I cannot make it back to my safety zone. I need to come up to your guys's." He said, "I need to get up there now." I believe is what he what what he said, and so I, I headed up the road and came up. The, mid slope to where almost to where the road came up to the top of the ridge and I noticed the fire had jumped the road in front of me. So now I'm stuck on a, in a drainage in a mid slope road with fire below me and fire ahead of me. So now that I'm trapped in this mid slope road in this drainage I had recognized a two track that had gone up a spur ridge to the top of the ridge. And as I'm going up the road uh, I hear something that no operator of any, any engine wants to hear the sound of a tire puncturing. Um, and uh, I, uh, this is as I'm going up, up the two track. I was in four low, uh, four wheel drive low, and I just kind of kept going on the rim uh, and got up to the top of the ridge. When I had gotten up to the top of the ridge top, I had seen this, what looked to be like a radio repeater site off to the south of me. And uh, the two track went right to where this repeater site was, which had a um, concrete building, a road that went all the way around it. Um, it was kind of my golden safety zone. At that point, there was a rock escarpment. One of the rocks gave way and high centered my vehicle on uh, this this uh, rock escarpment. Now I'm stuck. And uh, we decided, well, there's no way we could get out. We kept trying to get out, get out, shift and trying to get out. And then uh, that's when we decided we're gonna have to abandon the trucks. This isn't gonna be a safe spot. We're right at the edge, the top of this hill. I was getting, like, I didn't show it, but it kept it to myself. I was getting a little panicky, like, this is because Chris, everybody they stayed kind of calm, but then he started getting a little jumpy. I was like, wait, this doesn't happen all the time. I didn't really know what to do, so I kept following him, just being a new guy, following him. At that point, this is where the, the adrenaline really set in. Uh, my firefighter being his first year, 18 years old, uh, I could tell he was starting to panic. I was starting to panic. Um, my first thought was, okay, let, let's see if I can fire this off and uh, around this engine and try to uh, create a buffer. Um, and maybe we can ride it out there. Chris was doing his thing, getting his gear on. I was over there getting my gear on. I was getting fusees, filling my pockets up because I knew we were gonna have to burn out. And Chris was getting the drip torch set up. And I, I went back and I started the pump up. And by that time, there's little spot fires getting here, 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 because it was all windy and the fire's already cooking up that hill where we just drove up. At that point, uh, I could barely even get the drip torch lit. The winds were, had come up um, with great intensity. Um, by the time I did get the drip torch lit and I started down the road trying to fire off from, from our, our little road area first to anchor in, get some black in front of us in the uh, uh, approaching fire, um, the winds weren't in my favor and it just kept pretty much would, would blow it out. I couldn't get anything to take. 
seeing that I wasn't going to probably get the, the engine burn out around the engine, um, I made the decision on foot to make it to the safety zone. We weren't that far from the truck, about 100 feet, so he told me to go back and get the tools. And I went back, opened the side compartment, grabbed the tools, and just left it open. It was running, and by the time I came around the corner, the whole flame front came up the hill. I when all the heat hit right there. <clears throat> that's when it, it cinched all the back of my hair off and <laughs> stuff right there. So that's when I was just trying to keep up with him and catch back up with him. My goal was to fire out as I went along the two track to try to create a buffer and, and slick off. Um, hoping that uh, I'll have a, a enough black where we can actually, um, you know, won't take a lot of heat. Just trying, you know, at this point, analytical decision making was um, out the window. It was all intuitive. My engine boss, he was trying to give me some um, uh, advice over the radio. I think at one point I told him, hey, Trent, I can't talk to you right now. I've got to, I'm, I got to focus on trying to better the situation and probably not as kind words, but I think that's what I had, I had told him um, at one point on the radio and, uh, and as I kept trying to fire as we went, I couldn't really get anything to take. And every time I would get the grass lit, it would finger out. It wasn't really getting good consumption. It wasn't, it was, there wasn't a continuous fuel bed anymore. It was a lot of dirt up top of this saddle. I tried lighting something on the back end of the saddle so that I could literally just with the wind so that I could create a big black kind of wag dodge style, uh, create a escape fire. That's when I told Austin, I said, all right, we need to drop this pack. It's, our packs are just weighing us down. Um, I said, grab your fire shelter, keep your tool with you. We need to make a run for it out of this saddle. So I just dropped everything. By that time, it was all hot. My helmet blew off my head, went down the hill. I just, I dropped my tool, everything, dropped my pack. So I just took, I took my, uh, my shelter out and uh, so did he. And we were still just going and running, trying to get away, trying to find a good safe zone. It was so hot while we were running. I, I just remember holding that plastic, holding that shelter and that plastic on there was getting soft and sticky on my fingers <laughs> while we were running. Like all my burns, my burns didn't come from the fire, it's from the hot gases. And those hot gases, when they hit your face, and I'm sure a lot of people have experienced it, it's hard to breathe. It's just like a, I don't know, you, you even get that if you're barbecuing or something, you open it up and those hot gases hit you, it's just hard to breathe. We got to about where the knob was and we were taking a lot of heat. And I made the decision that we needed to deploy our shelter. I, we weren't going to make it. Um, we had the slope was against us. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the wind was against us. The fire was already bumping us. I was, we were both taking considerable amount of heat. So at that point, I looked at my firefighter. I looked at Austin and I said, we need to deploy now. I was able to create a black, clean black for us to deploy in on, on the, the lee side of this knob off the two track. And, uh, so I was able to get something to take. So I had a black spot, I had this, the side all picked out that I wanted to deploy and I had clean black and I proceeded to open up my, my shelter. The plastic tab on it had broken off when I tried to rip it off. So I had taken my glove and put it underneath my armpit and I also had my radio under my armpit and uh, got the wrapper off the, the shelter, went to open the shelter, radio and glove drop. So I grabbed my radio instead of my glove and I proceeded to get in the shelter um, from the ground. The winds were so, were so great at that point that if I had tried the traditional uh, way of stepping into my shelter and then falling to the ground, I, I believe my shelter probably would have been a kite. It was, the winds were that great. And at that point I noticed, I looked over at my firefighter and he still hadn't gotten in his fire shelter. He kind of just froze. And I was yelling at him, Austin, get in your fire shelter. I kept yelling at him just to get in his fire shelter. And as I'm getting in, I'm on the ground, I'm rolling into my shelter, I'm trying to get him to see that I'm getting in my shelter, he needs to get into it in the small little area of black that I just burnt out that I created. He took a look at me, looked behind him, took a look at me again, and then bolted. I had to make the decision, do I, do I follow him and try to get him into a shelter? And at that point, you know, the wind was so bad, my, my helmet had been had started blew off because of the wind the gust of wind that hit me now i have no helmet no glove i have my glove on my left hand but not on my right hand i made the decision that my my situation was deteriorating quick and i needed to be in that shelter so i got in the shelter screaming for for austin hoping he can hear me yelling for him to get in the shelter where i saw him deploy at he was yelling at me to try to deploy right there and i don't know i didn't like the spot he was at something gave me a little push and i said i just kept going and I thought I could push it and make it farther than what I guess he might have thought that we could have done. And I just saw the fire and where he was, where where he wanted to stop. And it, 
maybe I should have stopped and stayed with him just because I had more he had more experience than, than me. But I used my own intuition and kept going and and thought that my spot would be better for some reason. And I kept going down, but <laughs> straight, but down a little more downhill. I just had tunnel vision. I was set on going straight to that cement building. I had my mind set to it, and I wasn't going to stop. I jumped in a little sandy spot right there, and that's when I deployed right there. So I didn't, I didn't take any of the water or in, anything, like the radio, like they tell you to. I didn't have none of that. I just jumped in, no helmet, no gloves. My hands were all burnt. It was windy, so I did the whole thing, shake it out, try to get it, jump in as best as I could with all the wind coming. Trying to get everything all situated, digging a hole for my face because it was so hot and I couldn't breathe and my whole face was burned up by that time and just stayed in there. And, and so from the time I got in, from the time it hit, just because the fuel type it was in, sagebrush and grass, and it was so windy, it was about five minutes. It's just like the, the, whole, the whole waiting thing, you're, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to get burned over and you just keep thinking about it. And I, I don't know, you kind of get you, that weird smell like the, the gases and whatnot. And then uh, finally you just, you feel it, feel it coming, you can hear it, it starts getting all loud, it sounds like freight trains going right by you, and all of a sudden, pff, it hits you. And like, you, you almost like see that little glow too up on top, and you've got those little, little holes and stuff in your shelter, and you can see the glow, and you can definitely feel it. It's hard to stay in that shelter, because it gets so hot, but you just gotta keep thinking to yourself, it's a hundred times hotter if you jump out. So that's the only thing that kept me in there. I was thinking, well, this is the only thing that's protecting me right now. I better stay in here. It seems like forever. I, I say five minutes, but it could have been a lot shorter, but when you're in there, it seems like forever. Because once that wind hit, it kept wanting to lift the shelter. I put my gloved hand over my non-gloved hand and was protecting my head and my, my ears with it. And um, I'm still yelling for Austin, can't get out on the radio. I just, um, at that point, I just, the flame front had hit me and it, I, it was hot, but I knew it was, it was bearable. I was able to take it. I knew that I was getting burned, but I, I, uh, I just held down there, just kept thinking of my family, um, thinking of my fiance. And I, at that point, I, uh, I, the flame front had just about blown over me. I immediately, it was like standing in front of an oven and full blast and someone shutting it. It, it was the, the, it cooled down tremendously at that point. I took a peek. I could notice the dramatic temperature change. It went from unbearable to bearable real quickly. And uh, there was still stuff burning around me. Um, some of the sage was still burning. Um, I decided to stay in my, my shelter and, right, and a little longer. And I could tell my hand was, was pretty, hurting pretty badly. I could tell that my non-gloved hand was burned. I also could feel some small spots on my gloved hand that was starting to hurt too. Um, I burned my elbows. I didn't realize that they, they were hurting because they were burned and did nerve damage. So I didn't really realize the extent of my injuries. Um, I took another peek uh, and it, I noticed it was easy. I could get out. I was in the shelter for roughly around probably 14, 15 minutes. At that point, I got out of the shelter, didn't see Austin anywhere. I started to panic. I tried to get on the radio. It wasn't working at that point. The emotions overwhelmed me. I threw the radio down. I think I said a few choice words and threw the radio down and I heard probably the best thing I'd heard going for me that whole time was the Bendix King beeping back on. I call it the Bendix King beep. Um, it beeped back on because when I threw it down on the ground, it lodged the radio or the battery back in place. And uh, I was able to get on the radio and make notification that I was okay. At that point, they had a helicopter looking for us and I still couldn't find Austin. I got the helicopter finally came over to where our engine was uh, parked on the other side of the saddle. Our lights were still on, the pump was still running. The engine actually made it through the flame front. Um, I directed him to the, to the south of uh, the location where, where I was, told him that I was okay, but I'm missing my firefighter. He took one um, loop around and found out that Austin was just on the other side of the knob where, from where I deployed. Um, I did a little hike around the knob and found Austin. So I stayed in there about 20, 25 minutes, I'd say, maybe 30. And I just kept doing the thing, reaching out, checking to see if it was cool. And it was still, my hands were burned, so I hurt trying to come out. So I just stayed in there to keep that cool off a little bit more until I could come out. By the time I could come out, I kind of just slayed up, threw the shelter off and sat there and looked around thinking, what just happened? <laughs> and then as, as soon as that, I was like, I gotta find Chris. So I jumped up, took off up the hill, trying to find him and I, I found him. Finally, he was coming over the hill. He thought that I got killed and I thought he got killed. 
And our captain thought we both got killed, so they're all coming in the truck looking for us. And like, like my captain said, he thought he was going to just see me on the side of the road burned up somewhere. He didn't know. <laughs> so he was, he, he was kind of upset about that. But then me and Chris found each other, so we were happy that we were both still alive. And so we finally w made it to the, se or the cement building that we were trying to get to after everything was done and gone. It was still hot. We were all burned up. I saw him. He had his hand up in his, in his shirt like this, and I had mine like this, and trying to pull my collar up over my face because all the smoke and dust, and it was still hot, and it kind of hurt. And then finally a helicopter found us and came and picked us up. And then uh, flew us out to the highway, and that's when we met up with, with our captain, and then we went to the hospital after that. You watch these videos every year, and everyone, everyone watches them from like a, a backed up perspective, like, I don't, that won't happen to me, you know? I, I'm, you know, I have people around me and from my experience, you know, we can, we'll stay out of situations like that. Cause you watch a video and it's easier to armchair quarterback something and be like, you know, I, I can't believe you didn't see that coming, but it very well can. So be ready for it, train for it, do it in the dark. You know, how many times have you pulled out your shelter and tried to do it without seeing it? Put two people in a shelter, use different size people, just experiment because you never want to Assume, okay, I did this on flat ground during the daylight. This is going to be the ideal situation. This is when I'm going to use it. You don't know when you're going to have to use it. So the more practice, the better. You know, I know it gets old, and we all do our annual refresher, and we just kind of, some people, you know, humdrum through the whole shelter deployment part, and okay, we did it. We're good for the year. Captains or as, you know, crew leaders or whatever, you know, just throw it at people whenever. I would say that it be important to continue with the with the shelter deployment exercises and incorporate it with your crews every day you know if you drive up up the field one day just kind of quiz them if we had a fire right there and some went wrong where do you see for a deployment site you know I always be on the lookout for deployment sites so they're not as often as you think they are for a, a good survivable deployment site I think, you know, the, the, the training is the biggest portion and feeling comfortable in that shelter. You have to have that attitude is it could happen to me and I need to be prepared just like you are to fall a tree or be prepared just like you are to lay a hose lay up the hill to pull back to a safety zone. You have to prepare for that so that you know what you're going to do when you get in that situation. My big thing is training as though your life depends on it. And um, I know now I no longer train throwing a fire shelter or practicing a fire shelter just outside on the grass in front of the station it's now surprise when we're out in a hike get to a point where we've gone for our, at our hike where it's you know worked them pretty hard and then make them uh make them deploy as a practice i think that's helped taking the experience that i went through in the shelter helping me create the most realistic uh shelter practice training as possible being a smoke jumper our annual training with trying to practice deployment behind the propeller blast and sometimes you kind of laugh at that and think oh that's kind of silly but in real life, after being in the situation, I think if you could get an environment that resembles what you're going to be in the, you know, the closest as you can, the better you're going to be prepared. We saw the captain pulling out a shelter and we just reverted to our training, got the calming effect because we, we trained really hard with the shelters, the practice shelters, and it was kind of crazy with the, with the dust double and everything and kind of like blown away and panicking almost. And then once the shelter came out, Everything was back to routine practice and what our training called for. That training saved my life. Um, it, it sure helped me because I knew what to do, when to do it, where to do it. And kind of kept my mind about me. The fire shelter training, I mean, it helped. I mean, it, it just kicked right in. We train every year on the, on the fire shelter. You just sit there and every time you go through it, say, why, why we got to do this every year, every year? But now I know why, because it, it can save your life. You know, I guess uh, 
one thing that uh, that you're always taught in training, but I, I know I didn't do. I didn't have my gloves with me. I lost them in the river. Uh, I dropped my whole pack when I came out of the river. Where my elbows were, my my Nomex was never um, discolored or charred or burned. Um, my elbows were burned, and my hands, for that matter, were burned by, I believe, just the radiant heat. There was no discoloration on the Nomex, and I got pretty lucky. It was just my elbows and my hand that was not gloved. Um, my gloved hand only had two spots um, where the on the knuckles were. Uh, there was no airspace um, between the glove and my and my hand. So I had two uh, blisters here and here where, where they were holding the my other hand, trying to protect this other hand. And when I looked back on it and I talked through the investigation, they asked me if I had my gloves and I said, yeah, I had my gloves on the whole time. Well then, going back to the site, you know, my gloves were laying right there. At some point during it, you know, with everything moving so fastly, I must have, you know, taken my gloves off or however I did it, you know, just because I thought it was going to increase my mobility to, you know, get, get in the shelter faster, you know, and, um, you know, Things are happening so fast and there's so much adrenaline running and you're not focused on some of the smaller details of it. You catch, you know, the, you know, you're looking at more of the big picture and not the little things that happen and it's weird how your memory, you know, yeah, yeah, my gloves were on the whole time, you know, but you go back and look at it and you know, I guess they weren't. And how many times do you get out of the truck to do a quick size up when you're 50 feet away and you don't have your gear on? That was the result of me getting some severe burns to my hands and not having a fire shelter and having to ask a fellow employee to risk their life for me. You don't think about it much, but 60 seconds, 50 feet, that's nothing. First thing I guess from now on I'm going to do is when I get out, all my gear's going on. I guess that's the biggest thing I take from it. You know, it's an ever-changing environment. And it can change in 60 seconds. Halfway around, this work will be the end of me.